World War II was both a war and a crime. Millions of innocent people were killed, and millions more lost their homes and property. The victims cried out for justice. Those who brought this suffering must be made to answer for their crimes. After World War I, the Allies had decided in the peace treaty that people accused of war crimes should be tried. And one of the many concessions made to the Germans after the First World War was a change which the Allies had agreed to in the Versailles Treaty that the Germans would try these criminals themselves. Well, that proved an absolute and total fiasco. And uh, the Allies were not about to try that a second time. In late 1943, Allied leaders met for a conference in Tehran. World War II was far from over, but Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin were already thinking about how to deal with German war criminals. The Soviet leader raised his glass and offered a toast. I propose justice before a firing squad, Stalin reportedly said. He went on to suggest the execution of at least 50,000 Nazis. The idea enraged Churchill, who said the British people would never stand for mass murder. FDR thought Stalin was kidding and offered a joke of his own. Well, he'd be satisfied with 49,500 executions. Whether or not Stalin was joking, many agreed with him. A poll in early 1945 found that half of Americans wanted top German officers to be either killed or tortured. Near the end of the war, the Allies organized a war crimes commission and set up a system for bringing criminals to justice. The commission decided that individuals who committed atrocities against persons or property would return for trial near the scene of their crime. Individuals accused of specific crimes, like killing prisoners of war or downed airmen, would be brought before military courts. An international tribunal would try the major war criminals, Hitler and the men of his inner circle. But Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, and other high-ranking Nazis committed suicide before they could be arrested. But when the war finally did end, the Allies took an unprecedented step and put the leading Nazis on trial. In November of 1945, 21 accused war criminals filed into the Palace of Justice at Nuremberg. One by one, they entered their pleas. Nichts schuldig, not guilty. Our program deals with the story of what was truly the trial of the century. Nineteen fifty-four saw the publication of an extraordinary book entitled Tyranny on Trial, dealing with the trial of the major German war criminals at the end of World War II. It was authored by tonight's guest, former prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials, Whitney R. Harris. The 1999 revision is dedicated to the memory of Mr. Justice Robert H. Jackson, the United States Chief of Counsel at the trial of the major German war criminals. The laws of God and of man have been violated and the guilty must not go unpunished. On May 8, 1945, President Truman appointed Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson as the United States Chief of Counsel with the mission of bringing together the four major powers in developing a agreement for the trial of the major German war criminals. He also said that this must be a real trial, not a show trial, not a Stalin trial, but a trial which could result in acquitting a defendant if the evidence did not show guilt. There were four prosecution teams at Nuremberg reflecting the four major powers running the trials. Heading the prosecution along with Robert Jackson were a crack British team led by Sir Hartley Shawcross, British Attorney General, and his deputy, Sir David Maxwell Fife. 
France sent Champetier de Ribes, former French Undersecretary of State, and Russia Lieutenant General Roman Rudenko, Chief Prosecutor of the Ukrainian Republic. But Justice Jackson was not only the leader of the American prosecution staff, he was really the inspiration for this entire trial. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating, that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, the chief prosecutor for the United States, prepares to examine Dr. Yalmar Schock, Nazi finance minister. Dr. Schock, you said in 1938, we have fallen into the hands of criminals. How could I ever have suspected that? I'm sure you would want to help the tribunal by telling us who those criminals were. Hitler and, Saint Hitler. Hitler and his comrades. I'm asking you to name all that you included in that category of criminals at that time. Hitler, you know, is dead. Angeklagte Defendant Göring. Ich I might also include Himmler and Bormann. As to the other members of that uh, intimate circle, I do not know who they were. You named four men as criminals, three of whom are dead and one of whom you say admitted. I might add one more name. I suppose that Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop knew of the plans of Hitler constantly. Von Ribbentrop displays shock over this repeated violation of the prevailing strategy of Nuremberg defense to lay all misdeeds at the door of men beyond the reach of the court. The judges make some last notes as the trial approaches its end. On August 29th, 1946, the chief American prosecutor, Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, comes forward for his final summation. These men saw no evil, spoke none, and none was uttered in their presence. When we put all of their stories together, this is the ridiculous composite picture of Hitler's government that emerges. It was composed of a number two man who knew nothing of the excesses of the Gestapo which he created. A number three man who was merely an innocent middleman transmitting Hitler's orders without even reading them like a postman or a delivery boy. A foreign minister who knew little of foreign affairs and nothing of foreign policy. A security chief who was of the impression that the policing functions of his Gestapo and SD were somewhat on the order of directing traffic. A party philosopher who was interested in historical research and had no idea of the violence which his philosophy was inciting in the 20th century. Now this may seem like a fantastic exaggeration, but this is what you would actually be obliged to conclude if you were to acquit these defendants. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war, that there are no slaves, that there has been no crime. After 10 months in this place and 17,000 transcript pages of testimony, 19 of 21 defendants were convicted and sentenced. As Jackson put it, the evidence is there with such authenticity and in such detail that there can be no responsible denial of these crimes in the future and no tradition of martyrdom of the Nazi leaders can arise among informed people. And he hoped to create a precedent that would make explicit 
that to persecute, oppress, and do violence to individuals or to minorities on political, racial, or religious grounds is an international crime. Today, 50 plus years later, the world is again witnessing an attempt to apply that precedent in new war crimes proceedings in Brussels and in Rwanda to serve again as the voice of human decency following the unspeakable tr atrocities in Rwanda and in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We're following the path beaten by Robert Jackson for the protection of basic human liberties. Nuremberg stands firmly against the resignation of man to the inhumanity of man. This brings us to the point that the really the most important thing that was achieved at Nuremberg was not the conviction of these men and not the sentences imposed, but the determination for history that waging aggressive war is a crime 